Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the invitation to speak today in such unusual and exceptional um, circumstances. It's a huge pleasure um, to be here. I think none of us obviously could have ever imagined we would be um, having any kind of conference in this way, that we would be speaking to each other uh, from spare rooms in our homes, from corners of offices, from different corners of the country, rather than being able to come together. Uh, thank you to Paul Griffiths and to all of his team for organising the event and to all of the other speakers as well. We couldn't really have imagined that any of this would happen, that our communities, our lives would be so upended in this way, with schools, pubs, shops and offices all closed. You, of course, the police, all carried on because that's what you always do, what you always have to do, and we are deeply grateful for that. For you, perhaps things were perhaps even more upended than ever with our police officers suddenly being expected to police people for meeting with their friends or for sitting on a bench in a park, things that we could never have imagined happening to policing in the UK. And so it is a tribute to you as senior officers across the country and also to our long tradition of policing by consent and to the spirit for people across our communities that you were able to navigate that with such sensitivity. So I bring thanks from the Home Affairs Select Committee and from many of our colleagues across Parliament for the work that you've had to do during this period. Our committee did look in some detail in the early um, period of the coronavirus crisis at the policing of the pandemic, the policing of those early regulations. And we found that whilst police had never uh, had to adapt to something so unexpected in this way before, that officers did face this with, navigated it sen sensitively and carefully. And so I think that has been hugely important to uh, the, the four principles, the four E's that your officers were operating was very important to the way in which uh, lockdown was policed, but also to maintaining that support for the lockdown regulations and support for policing during that period. period. And this has been, I think, an uh, unprecedented time for the, the resurgent in community spirit that we've seen in many of our towns and cities and we've all shown our appreciation for key workers uh, and been brought together in ways that we wouldn't have expected but they've also brought tensions to the service new challenges for public order policing that I, I want to come to in a moment but also shockingly we have seen still the increase in assaults on emergency service workers on the front line of protecting us all and it has been truly awful to see some of the attacks on police officers no one should have to endure this kind of violence and assault least of all those who are charged with protecting us all and keeping us safe so it's why i welcome the government's commitment to a police covenant following on some of the work that we've seen in Parliament on protecting the protectors and welcome the commitment by the Home Office and by senior police leaders to do more to support those right across policing officers and staff who do such an important job. Mm -hmm. I also want to welcome some of the commitments that have been made too in recent months from uh, senior police officers and from the Home Office to do more to ensure that policing represents all of our communities and can maintain consent in all communities as well and the readiness to respond to the challenges that came from the uh, outpouring of horror that we all shared at the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis in May, that has made all of us look again at our own society in the UK and at the progress that still needs to be made in tackling racial injustice. The strength of feeling behind the Black Lives Matters protest, the sense of frustration and injustice about ongoing racism is a challenge to us in Parliament is a challenge to all organisations and it is a challenge to you in policing as well. 
And again, the Select Committee has been looking as part of our inquiry uh, into race and policing two decades on from the McPherson report into the racist killing of Stephen Lawrence. We've been looking as part of our ongoing inquiry that in fact started uh, nearly two years ago, was interrupted by the general election, um, looking at what has and what hasn't changed since then and um, uh, looking, drawing together evidence before we come to our conclusions. And we've seen the encouraging evidence that of the latest figures show the police now has the highest proportion of black, Asian and minority ethnic officers, as well as female officers since records began. But still the troubling evidence that it is still not representative, still two decades after McPherson, and particularly in promotions and with BME officers, more than twice as likely to be dismissed from the service. We've seen too, we've been looking at the evidence around things like stop and search, where the committee has, uh, in many of our um, previous inquiries and work, supported stop and search as an important tool for policing. But we've also heard the serious concerns about the way that stops and searches are done in many areas, the way that vehicle stops are being done with no record of ethnicity and also the scale of lockdown of uh, stops during lockdown among particular communities and groups the 20,000 stops of young black men during lockdown in London equivalent to a quarter of young black men living in London uh, the evidence that uh, was put to um, one of our recent uh, evidence sessions Policing has to be fair and seen to be fair. And that's why I think that these issues are so important that uh, as part of our inquiry, but also it's so important to see the police uh, themselves were looking at what now needs to be done to ensure that uh, it is fair and effective. And we will be looking closely to see the measures that the NPCC puts forward. We've heard extremely uh, good and inspiring evidence from uh, officers in different parts of the country about the work they are doing with different communities to ensure um, fair policing and to ensure that racism of any kind is always challenged. We uh, will look forward to, to hearing um, evidence from, uh, from you and from others across policing into a new inquiry that we are just in the process of starting into police complaints where there have been concerns, for example, about the length of time um, in uh, being taken in the complaints process and problems in the complaints process to make sure that that works effectively as well. But I wanted then, Fanny, to just, just reflect a bit more on the wider challenges for policing and drawing on some of our previous completed reports. Because although this has been a very challenging time, very difficult time for policing, and we've seen um, some really important and uh, resilience and, and response, this has also actually been a very challenging 10 years for policing. The scale of cuts that policing has had to endure, which we on the committee have made clear our views that we think the cuts were damaging. Um, I think they were destructive and we lost important capacity in policing at a time when crime was changing very substantially, when cases were becoming more complex, when social problems were growing as a result of other services being cut back. So your officers were dealing with mental health crises, with missing people with dementia, with complex online stalking or abuse or checks child sexual exploitation, changing patterns of extremism, and very often picking up the pieces where other services had failed when things went wrong. So it is hugely important that more officers are being recruited now, that recruiting in many places is now back on track after the difficulties during the lockdown period. And it is essential that that recruitment is now maintained. The Charter has now announced the comprehensive spending review. It is crucial that police budgets are protected as part of that comprehensive spending review and that that recruitment can continue. We need to get police back onto the streets and into our communities. We need to be able to restore many of the neighbourhood policing that uh, was previously cut back over the last decade that our select committee has highlighted um, uh, many times. 
But it's also really important that we see many of the services that surround policing also being maintained and not um, hit in the comprehensive spending review. And there will be other areas where, for example, in youth services, where we have argued for statutory youth service funding and increase in investment in youth services, at a time when young people have had a very difficult time, when with schools out, with normal structures suspended, some of the most vulnerable children, even more vulnerable than ever. And a sense for many young people that suddenly the normal rules are not applying, that normal structures just aren't there. And coping with that legacy is going to be hard. We need not just the work in schools, but also in our youth service in our support services as well, to be able to work with the police, to be able to work with our communities in order to prevent future social problems and future problems with crime and disorder uh, coming down the track. And as well as the other wider prevention mental health services, the drug and alcohol services that's so important, but also raise particular concern that we've started to pick up now on the committee around the situation in the courts. And some of your members, police officers across the country and um, uh, police chiefs, were raising with us very early in the COVID crisis the challenge to um, policing and to the delivery of law and order from what was happening in the courts and in the rest of the criminal justice system. We raised it as part, in fact, of our uh, inquiry uh, report uh, quite early on during the crisis. And since then, we've seen things get worse and we've seen the delays to, um, to criminal cases uh, also raising real concerns about whether people were seeing justice being done, about the impact that that was having, the knock-on impact that that was having on policing as well. I know that the government has now announced a, an action plan to address um, the courts and the court delays. I hope that that does make some progress because it's really important that we see that happening. But I think the, the, the wider challenge for policing as we come through this, the acute problems around the COVID crisis, the now immediate problems around the way the government will respond to recession and the uh, economic and social problems as well, is to think as well of those broader issues for policing about how policing adapts. We've seen other services and other organisations and businesses adapt to new technology forced to do so by what has happened in the COVID crisis. Policing hasn't been in quite that same situation because so much of the work of policing has had to carry on uh, as it normally does. But we know that our policing needs a huge upgrade in terms of the technology that it's able to use but also to be able to deal with the greater complexity of the different kinds of crimes that we face and the different sorts of challenges for the future. So your challenge in policing is to try and keep up with the complexity, to be able to adapt sufficiently, to be able to be resilient, to make sure you can maintain consent in all our communities and address injustice, be it from racism or any other kinds of discrimination within policing. But there is also the challenge for the Home Office, which is to support you in the work that you do to make sure that you have the funding that you need, that the support services around policing also get that funding. But I would also finally highlight, I think we also need to see sustained strategic leadership from the Home Office in how we deal with those different kinds of crimes, how we pull together the partnerships that can be most effective at keeping people safe, at bringing together the different organisations that need to do so rather than just leaving you and policing to do that alone. Over the last 10 years, as well as seeing the reductions in funding for policing, we also, I believe, saw too much of a withdrawal from the Home Office away from strategic approach to policing, to tackling crime, to supporting public safety. We need that new partnership in place. We need the backing of the Home Office, not just for the individual things that the police do, but for being able to play that leadership role with other services as well. If we can do that, we can come through this crisis. We can build back better, be it in policing as in any other area. But if we still see fragmentation, if we see individual services having to work alone, then it will be much harder. I hope the lessons from the COVID crisis will be about working together
seeing the the opportunities to do so rather than just seeing the greater fragmentation. Thank you very much.